If you're in doubt that he loves you, then simply look at the cross and stare at it for quite a while, and you'll see the love of God spelled out. Well, last Sunday, we began looking at a very puzzling and perplexing question. Here's the question. Why did Jesus let Lazarus die? Why did Jesus let Lazarus die? The Bible tells us here in John chapter 11 in these verses that the Lord loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We saw that down there in verse 5. It says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Spelled out very plain. He loved them. Okay, And yet he let Lazarus die. Now that causes us a great deal of problems and puzzlement and perplexity. If Jesus loves us so, we argue, why does he let these things happen to us? He loved Lazarus, he loved Mary, he loved Martha, his sisters, and yet he let Lazarus walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and he experienced the pain of death. He physically died, because you know the story, if you've read John 11, by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has already been dead four days. We have reason to believe that on the day Jesus got this message that Lazarus died that day. And we know that Jesus can heal people from a distance. So if he loves him, why let him die? Why let his sisters go through such crushing grief? Why let him do this? How could our Lord Jesus Christ love Mary and Martha and Lazarus and allow them to go through all this? And we can update the question, not just long ago in John 11, we could say that the Lord Jesus loves all his people. Would you agree with me this morning? He loves all his people? He does. Whether you think so or not, he does. He loves all his people. And yet, the Bible states over and over again that he loves us, that if you belong to God, if you're his child, God loves you with an eternal, undying, perfect love because he's perfect, his love is perfect. And yet, sitting here before me today, and some of you know what I'm about to say, there are people right now in this room who are carrying heavy burdens, heavy loads, people who are facing all kinds of difficulties. Whether you are aware of the details or not, they're going through quite a bit. They're going through trials right now as we sit here together. If we were just to go through this congregation this morning and start asking each person, what are your burdens? What are your difficulties? What are your trials? What are you going through? Folks, we would leave here so depressed, we wouldn't know what to do. We'd be so down. And this is because we all have trials and difficulties and burdens. Now, we do, don't we? I'll try that again. We do, don't we? And I'm not just talking about a case of the Hong Kong hangnails or stuff like that. I'm talking about serious problems. We have them. Some of us have greater trials and difficulties than others, no doubt. But all of us have difficulties of one kind or another. We have them. Now, I imagine if you were to ask me today, Preacher, what's your difficulty? What's your burden? Well, I'm sure I could come up with a few. I could probably name one or two right right off the bat here. And yet, here's this God who we say loves us so much that he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to purchase our salvation on the cross of Calvary, and yet, my friends, he loves us, and even though he loves us that much, he allows us to have these burdens and difficulties. And you know this is the question people struggle with. If he loves us so much, why do we have so many problems? Some people will say, well, the reason that this God who loves you so much allows these things to happen to you, to have these burdens and difficulties, is because he can't do anything about them. Now, that's what they say. He'd like to, but he just can't. He doesn't have the power. Now, that's what a Jewish rabbi said about 40 years ago in a best-selling book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Well, we know he loves people, but he just can't do a thing about it. Folks, I hope you don't believe that at all because our God can do something about it. Our God has power. It is wrong for that rabbi or anybody else to say, God can't do a thing about it. If God can't do anything about it, folks, we are definitely doomed, are we not? If he can't, then we're done. The Bible says that this God is sovereign, that this God is unlimited in power. The Bible says that he simply spoke and the whole world comes into existence. All of the universe happens when he says, let it be, and there it is. 
Now, you show me who else can do that. Nobody else can do that. No, it's not a lack of power that keeps God from taking our burdens away. That's not the point. God has all kinds of power. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say it. God has all power, does he not? All of it. All of it. Aren't you a little tired of these people on TV? Well, we're going to do this and that. Oh, fooey, you're going to do what God lets you do. Let's just be blunt here. You won't get out of bed in the morning if God doesn't say so. Have you thought about that? It's not a lack of power. God is omnipotent. He has all power, and yet he allows burdens to come into our life. Other people say, well, if it's not because he can't do something about it, it's because he really doesn't love you. That's what this is about. He doesn't love you. But he has shown us his love when he sent his son to die on Calvary's cross. Again, look at that big cross on the wall behind me. Just look at that and think about that. That's how much God loves you. Hold your place in John 11. Go with me to Romans 5 just a moment. Romans 5. We looked at this briefly in Sunday school this morning, but it bears repeating. John 5, or excuse me, Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 8. Boy, highlight this, underline it, start, whatever. Make sure it jumps out at you from the page. Here it is. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, that's a message to itself. While we're still sinners, God loves us. How about that? Not after we become pretty good. He loves us while we're still sinners. He didn't spare his own son, but he freely gave him up for us. How could we ever doubt the love of God? And yet here's this great problem in John chapter 11. You've got this all-powerful God, you say, who loves his children so much with an undying, perfect, eternal love, and his children have all kinds of problems and difficulties. All kinds of headaches, all kinds of heartaches, all kinds of burdens. So how does this work? Now, the Lord Jesus gave an answer right here in these first six verses of John chapter 11. Look at verse 4 with me again. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. There's the answer. This is why it happened. He said when he heard about the sickness of his friend Lazarus, he said there in verse 4, this sickness is not unto death. He was not saying Lazarus was not going to die. That's not what he said. He did not say that. He was simply saying that death was not going to have the final ultimate word. It was not going to have the final say. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're sitting here saved, you know this too. Death is not the last word for you either, is it? It's not. And he sent the message back that he, was, he knew about what happened here. And he went on to give the reason and explain why it was necessary for his friend whom he loved, Lazarus, to die. And he says it, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. There it is. That's what this is for, for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus saw in this sickness an opportunity to glorify God. Now, when's the last time you know people who look at sickness that way? We've got people scared to death about dying because of this virus. Scared. They're telling us, they're telling a church in California right now, we're going to fine you, we're going to put your preacher in jail if you keep meeting because thousands of people go there. Meanwhile, the the rate of infection is not even 1% in the state of California. But they won't tell that side of the story. Interesting, isn't it? That's the reason Lazarus had to die, ladies and gentlemen, so that God could be glorified. That's why. That's the reason that his sisters had to go through such grief, that they had to bear it so that God could be glorified. And as we, as we began looking last Sunday morning, this whole business of the glory of God in suffering and in trials, I gave you some general principles about how the glory of God is, is shown in this. I just want to repeat a couple things here about what I said here. Not, not exactly repeat it, but but put it a little bit different way today and then build on that just a little bit. Jesus was concerned about Mary and Martha. There's no doubt about that. And he was concerned about how the death of Lazarus made them feel because, folks, we know this, do we not? Now, listen carefully to this. You know this. When God's people hurt, God cares about that, doesn't he? You agree with that? When God's people are hurting, God not only sees it and God not only knows it, God cares about it, does he not? Now, he does. He does. Whether you think so or not, he does. But Jesus had an overriding concern here about something bigger than his friend Lazarus being sick and his friend dying. And his overriding concern was the glory of God. 
Now, please get this. Please understand this this morning. When Jesus allowed Lazarus to die, it wasn't because he didn't care about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That wasn't it at all. It was because he had this overriding concern. Every parent sitting in this room here this morning ought to be able to understand that term, overriding concern. As a parent, I've had to allow my son to suffer certain things. When he was very little, some of you know this, he had to have two surgeries on his eyes when he was very little. Do you think that was fun for me and Brenda? In fact, I've had to suffer some things myself and put my own body through some pain and anguish because I had an overriding concern. When you or some loved one of yours goes through surgery, we know surgery is not pleasant, is it? They're called painkillers for a reason, aren't they? Because you have pain. It is not normal to take a scalpel and cut into someone and say, let's go see what we find. That's not normal. Why do we have to go through surgery? Well, it's because that surgery brings us something else and pain and anguish of the surgery is all worthwhile because of what we get through that surgery. We've got people sitting here right now who've had heart surgery, more than a few of us. And folks, you, you ask them what, the, what that was like. It wasn't fun. They, they have to crack your sternum. They have, to, they have to crack your breastbone and open you up to get in there. <laughs> That's no fun. And then they sew you back up with wire. That's no fun. But it helps you to get past the problem. Well, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but he had this overriding concern, and his overriding concern was the glory of God. He says it right there in verse 4, but for the glory of God. Just like you will put your child through pain and anguish in surgery sometimes because you have an overriding concern about the health of that child, so Jesus put Mary and Martha and Lazarus through this experience because he had this overriding concern, and that was the glory of God. If we are children of God, we are to have the same overriding concern. We are to be concerned about the glory of God. Have you thought lately about the glory of God? In fact, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that if we are children of God, this is to be our main concern, not ourselves, not our pleasures. In all of life is that God should be glorified. That should be our main concern. Bill Savage should not care so much about what happens to him as he cares and is concerned about God and his glory and about God being glorified. Glorified. That's to be the overriding concern in my life and in every believer's life is that God be glorified. Now, some will say, is that really in the Bible, Brother Bill? Is that really in the Scriptures? As a matter of fact, it is because the Bible says we are to love our Lord, the Lord our God how? With all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. And we are to put God above everything else. Now, the Bible says that, right? The Bible does. It says that. That means the glory of God should be the supreme thing in our lives. So when, not if, but when the trial comes, if I am living as a child of God, as I ought to live, I should not say, why is this happening to me? How come this bad stuff came my way? That's not what I should say. My concern should be, how can my God be glorified through this? Because that ought to be my concern. Now, the Bible defines the sinner is someone who is not concerned about the glory of God. The Bible says the sinner is someone who falls short of the glory of God. You know Romans 3.23, you know that. The sinner is not interested in the glory of God, where the glory of God is being magnified and honored. The sinner lives for himself. We see this all the time, folks. You tell me those rioters, those looters, those people burning and stealing, they care about others? No, they don't. They care about themselves. They don't care about God. They don't. And they say, well, the, somebody said the you know, the, the problem with sin is, right in the middle of it is what? I. There's an I right in the middle of sin. Sin is saying, I don't care about God. I don't care about His glory. I don't care about the God who made me. I don't care what He's all about. I'm going to live for myself. It's all about me. The child of God can't live that way, and you know it. The child of God can't live like that any longer. Why? Because he's been redeemed. The glory of God is important to him. He's not the same person that he was. Before God saved him, he's different. We see this in Paul's writings. Go with me to 2 Corinthians just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And listen to what Paul says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. He says here, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died, that's Jesus died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, 
but for him who died for them and rose again. These verses tell us that the children of God are to be interested in the glory of God. Verse 14 says that Jesus' death on the cross, that we died with Christ. Verse 15 says we live no longer for ourselves. That's the problem with the sinner. He lives for himself. You see it every day. You have traveled on Interstate 44, haven't you? Newsflash, there's sinners out there. And if you doubt me, watch as they pass you in a no-passing zone. They'll do it. But here's the Christian. He dies with Christ on the cross. He does not live for himself any longer. But he lives for him who died for him and rose again. We're concerned about the glory of God because of what Jesus did for us there on Calvary's cross. He redeemed us from sin. And he made us, as verse 17 says in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as a new creation. Behold, all things are new. Old things are passed away. We become new. He says that in verse 17. Now, Paul gives us an example of this over there in Philippians chapter 1. Paul was in prison when he wrote that letter. I know some of you know that. And Paul could have spent all his time in prison torturing himself. You, you heard Gary tell some of those stories a while ago. He could have tortured himself with this question. Why is it that the God who has all power and this God who loves me as his own dear precious child, why is it that God has allowed me to go through this experience of being in prison? Why did God let this happen to me? He could have spent all of his days doing that. I'm separated from my friends. I'm separated from the churches I help start. I'm separated from the work that I enjoy. I'm nowhere near that. And I've done so much for God after all. And by the way, Paul could have legitimately and honestly said that because he did a lot. Most of us can't say that we've done the things Paul's done. And yet here I am, after all of that, after having done all these marvelous things, here I am for this God who loves me, so he claims, and who is all-powerful. And here I am sitting in jail. He's allowed this to happen to me. Why? Now, you know Paul could have said this. Okay, that's it. I'm done with this God. I'm finished with him. If this is the kind of God he is, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm not going to have any more to do with him. Now, you know he could have said that. You say, well, how do you know that, Brother Bill? Because I've heard church members say that. Many church members over the years have said things like that. Well, you know, I went to church. I even went to Sunday school for many years. I I even had a pen that I used to wear telling people how many years I went to Sunday school. Perfect attendance, you know, never been. And then God allowed this disaster, this tragedy to come into my life and overtake me. And if that's the way this God is, well, I'm through with him. I told the pastor's class this morning, you want to know who some of the most hardcore atheists are? People that used to be in church. Some of the hardest heads, hardest hearts. God did not please me. God did not take all my problems away. And if that's the way God is, I'm done. I'm through with him. Paul could have said that, but here's what he does say. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1, and look what he says there. In Philippians 1, in verse 12, here's what Paul says. Now, this is, this is key. Get this, please. Philippians 1, verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I'm in prison, but the gospel keeps going out even though I'm in prison. Now, when's the last time you heard a prisoner say that? Get me out of here. Get my lawyer. Get the judge. Redo the whole trial. Get me out. That's not Paul. I like the way that California pastor said that a few days ago on a news program. He said, you know, my hero is the apostle Paul. And he never went into a town to start a church and said, well, tell me what the hotels are like. He never said that. He would say, show me what the prisons are like, because that's where I'm going to go, most likely. And he witnessed to people. He shared the gospel with people. Paul says, I want you to know that this imprisonment of mine is really turning around very, very well for the glory of God. God is being glorified through my imprisonment, and I'm just as happy as the pig in a pigsty, as the saying goes, right here in prison. I'm happy. Because God is being glorified in my time in prison. God is being glorified. His gospel is being furthered. Now, folks, that's just a review of what I said to you last Sunday about this overriding concern of the glory of God. This morning in my remaining moments, I want to go on and give you a little bit and show you how Jesus was glorified in the raising of Lazarus, his friend. And then I want to give you some conclusions about what comes out of this that I hope will make clear this whole issue for you and will help you, help your heart find some rest here. 
around this matter of, uh, uh, on this matter of Christian people and their trials. Well, so how was Jesus glorified in the death of Lazarus? Here's, here's the first way. Here's the first one. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it proved without a doubt, without a doubt, that he really was the Son of God, and it caused many people to believe in him. Stay in John chapter 11. Go down to verse 45. John chapter 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. There it is. A dead man comes back to life. It causes many people to believe in him. I should think so. If a man is dead for four days and we see him come back, I think that would make you believe in the one that raised him, would it not? I believe it would. Jesus stepped up there and to, the, and, and to that tomb a, a, after one of the sisters says, Well, now, Lord, wait, 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 wait. Look at verse 39. His sister Martha says, after Jesus says, take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. He stinks, Jesus. You don't want to do this. They did not embalm people back in Jewish culture. They wrapped them in strips of cloth with spices, like they did the body of Jesus. They didn't embalm. So the body would quickly decay. There was no storage. There was no frozen place to keep the body. There's no embalming fluid, none of that. She says, he's going to stink. Jesus stepped there and says, take the stone away. And he says in verse 43, Lazarus, come forth. There it is. And Lazarus comes forth. We too often picture Lazarus kind of, you know, st staggering out of there, walking out of there, you know, stumbling along and bound in his grave clothes. And, and I think the implication from John's uh, account here is the power of God carries him out of there and sets him down in front of people. And people who saw that believed in Jesus. I would too, wouldn't you? I would too. There were many of them who believed, John says. I should think so. I don't know how anybody could not have believed in Jesus. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, and out he comes. Now, by the way, you know this. He says, Lazarus. Why? Because if he just says, come forth, everybody comes out. Everybody comes out. He says, Lazarus, come forth. The power of Jesus is here. And Jesus has to say to them in verse 44, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go, he says. And many believed in him, verse 45. Jesus was glorified because people saw his power. They believed on him. Do you understand what a glorious thing it is for the people to believe in Jesus? For any people to believe in Jesus. Folks, that is a glorious thing. That is a wonderful thing. Oh, how I wish I could somehow get this into your minds and into your hearts that St. Clair Southern Baptist Church would become so absorbed with this and it's such a fever pitch about this on this point of what a glorious thing it is for people to believe in Jesus. That's a glorious thing. Isn't it? It's a glorious thing. Stop and think for just a moment about how short this life is and how long eternity is. This is the reason why so many of us grumble and complain so much about what's happening to us down here because... We assume that this life is the most important thing. Can we just settle this once and for all? This life does not last forever, but eternal life with God never ends. It never ends. The Bible constantly says this life is short. Eternity is long. And after you've thought about how short this life is and how long eternity is, how about this? Have you thought about how beautiful heaven is? We used to sing an old song, how beautiful heaven must be. And by contrast, how horrible hell is. Have you thought about that lately? Well, that's too depressing. Folks, if you're saved, you were saved from that horrible place called hell. You were saved from that. And then remember the difference between heaven and hell is this thing of believing in Jesus. You don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven. You're not. So I ask you now, child of God who has been purchased with the precious blood of Christ, Aren't you willing to suffer in order for somebody to believe in Jesus? Are you willing? It's a glorious thing for the people, for people to believe in Jesus. Parents with an unbelieving child this morning, would you be willing to suffer some great trial if you knew that God could use that, use that trial to bring to salvation your children? Would you be willing to endure that and suffer that? Wife of some unbelieving husband, 
Would you be willing to undergo keeping in mind how short life is, how long eternity is, how beautiful heaven is, how horrible hell is? Would you be willing to suffer some great trial in order for God to use that trial to bring your unbelieving spouse, your unbelieving husband to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Can't you see how God might be glorified in that? Jesus was glorified because what he did led to the belief of many people. And when people believe in Jesus, that's always glorifying to God. Second thing here real quick. Not only did many people believe in him because he raised him from the dead, the raising of Lazarus also tremendously blessed Lazarus and his sisters and the disciples of Jesus, all of them. Now stop and think about this. It blessed them so much that the blessing far outweighed the suffering. Think about that. They watched their brother die, and that was painful, and it was hard to watch that. But his resurrection far outweighed the suffering, did it not? He's alive again. I saw him die, and now he's alive. Lazarus suffered the pangs and the pains of death. His sister suffered terrible guilt. His, Jesus' disciples suffered this great perplexity of mind. Jesus, if you loved him, why didn't you save him and not let him die? Why would Jesus do this to Lazarus? and to his sisters, but each one, of those, each one of those ended up with such a great blessing that when they received the blessing, it far outweighed. They didn't think anything more about what they'd been through. The blessing far outweighed the trial and the suffering. It was much better. Think about Lazarus for just a moment. God did not cheat Lazarus when he let him die and by allowing him to go through all this. I'm not saying that it was pleasant for Lazarus to die. I'm not saying that. But God did not cheat Lazarus, not for a moment. Because bless, the blessing God gave him that he received in this experience was greater than the suffering he went through, the suffering that he endured. His blessing was bigger, would you not say? He was greater. The Bible tells us that Lazarus became something of a celebrity after Jesus raised him from the dead. Go to chapter 12 of John's gospel. Look at verse 9. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death, to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. I'd say Lazarus came out of his deal pretty good, wouldn't you? He was dead, and now he's alive. I mean, he was used by God as a mighty, powerful, effective instrument of evangelism even after he had been raised from the dead. He was instrumental in bringing many people. It says there in John chapter 12, many believed on Jesus because of this. Oh, my friend, what would we be willing to suffer in order to be made into an effective instrument of evangelism? Mary and Martha were also blessed here, along with all the rest of the disciples of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, look there in John chapter 11, go to verse 15. Jesus says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. I'm glad I wasn't there when he died because I want you guys to see this, that you may believe. There it is. That you may believe. Mary and Martha and all the disciples of Jesus already believed in Jesus. What do you mean that they may believe? But he says those words in verse 15. What's he talking about? He says, so that your faith can grow, that this will challenge you and help your faith to grow, that you'll believe even more. Folks, the point of believing, the point of worship is that we believe God for more and more, not less and less. Amen? The idea is to believe Him more, not less, more. And oh, how the faith of Mary and Martha and all these other disciples of Jesus grew through that experience. Look at that. A dead man comes back to life. Dead four days. They already believed in Jesus, but here they received such a revelation of power and glory in Jesus Christ that their faith grew by leaps and bounds. Here Jesus is standing there before Mar Martha saying, I am the resurrection life down there in verse 25. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. He says that to her. And oh, how that blessed the hearts of Mary and Martha and those disciples because they saw there in that Lord the one who has supreme authority over death. Folks, when our loved ones die in Christ, we don't have to be afraid or scared or, or down and out because we know our loving Lord takes them home to be with Him the moment they die. We don't have to be afraid of that. God has authority over death. Not doctors, not hospitals, not Tony Fauci, okay? He doesn't. 
God has authority over death. And even they had faith before this, but their faith grew. Finally, the death of Lazarus put in motion what was necessary in order for Jesus to be crucified. What happened here with the raising of Lazarus convinced the authorities they could not let this go on. They couldn't allow this Jesus guy to run around any further, go any farther. If you read the rest of John chapter 11, you'll find that they plot to kill Jesus. We've got to stop him, and John chapter 12 says we're going to kill Lazarus too. We can't let this happen. It was the raising of Lazarus that really set in motion the machinery that led directly to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, how that has glorified God down through the years. All these things show that the benefits of the death of Lazarus far outweighed the grief and the pain that his death and trials caused. And so it is with our trials, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Now, your trials are difficult. There's no doubt about that. But God has a purpose in your trials, whether you think so or not. He does. God gets the glory through your trials, and he benefits that, that he gives you, the benefits that are received are far greater than the grief and the pain that the trials cause. The Bible says that our trials are for our good and for his glory. Last time I checked, Romans 8, 28 was still in the Bible. Remember that verse? We know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. A great old song puts it like this. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see him. One glimpse of his dear face, our sorrows all will be erased. So let us run the race till we see Christ. I'll never know in this life completely how Romans 8.28 works out. But oh, thank God there is coming a day when all God's people will see Jesus and then all of the trials of this life will be so small compared to how great and glorious He is. Amen? Quickly, some conclusions, and then we'll pray. These two messages about the glory of God in our trials lead us to several conclusions. Here's one of them. These things happen to us. Now, hold on to somebody. Hold on to something. Here it comes. These things happen to us as children of God, not by accident but they are for the glory of god now wait a minute you mean a car wreck is not, folks to us it's an accident not to god number two we don't have to be able to see how god gets the glory out of our circumstances in order for him to get the glory out of it now be sure you hold on to that one so many people say that and sometimes with great anger well you can't tell me that god meant this or that god can get any glory out of this not this this is too painful too hard too sad what that person is saying is, I don't see how God can get any glory out of this. doesn't mean he can't. They just can't see it. But you don't have to see it in order for it to be true, folks. I've never seen an electron, have you? I've never seen a proton, have you? I've never seen them. But I understand that that's the fact. There are protons and electrons. And you don't have to see everything in order for it to be a reality. You don't have to be able to explain how God gets the glory out of something. You see, God is smarter than all of us. I know that shocks the talk show host, but God is smarter than all of us, and them too. I know that offends Oprah, but she can get over it, okay? God's smarter. That's a bitter pill for some of us to swallow. God is smarter than us. Oh, how I wish I could get everyone to understand that God says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. In Isaiah 55, the problem most of us have is we don't realize how great our God is. We may often sing how great thou art, but do you understand how great he is? He's magnificent. He's beyond us. We think of God in terms of ourselves, in terms of our own limitations. Here's a third conclusion. God gets glory out of something. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt when he gets glory out of something. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean it won't bring pain and sorrow. I think a lot of people make this mistake. Well, if God gets the glory out of something, why does it hurt so much? Because God gets the glory doesn't mean something doesn't hurt. Folks, he got glory out of watching his one and only son die on the cross, didn't he? And that hurt. Look at me now. That hurt. That hurt. And God got glory out of that. Doesn't mean you won't have any pain or any sorrow in the middle of it. Here's a fourth conclusion. This is more of a positive nature here. When we are faced with great trials and difficulties and afflictions, 
We should do the same thing Mary and Martha did. We should just lay it before Jesus and not make any demands. Do you see here in John chapter 11, go down there to verse 3. Do you see them demanding anything? Isn't it interesting how Mary and Martha approached this problem with their brother Lazarus? They say in verse 3, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. He was sick and all they did was send a message to Jesus. They didn't say, come right away, Lord, heal him or do something. You're Jesus, do something. Today we've got people running all across the religious landscape, making all kinds of demands on God, teaching us and telling us, you tell God what you want. Folks, that's not how this works. Can we be blunt? That's not how this works. We ask God. We never demand from God. Never. Do the same thing that Mary Martha did. A man got up to preach some time ago. And in spite of the fact that the Bible tells us people like Mary Martha did not demand from God, here's what this man says. The key to praying, he says, is to command God. Did you all catch that? Command God. Last time I checked, he is the commander, not us. Friends, do as Mary and Martha did. Lay that need before the Lord and just leave it with him. Don't make any demands. You can read about King Hezekiah way back in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 19. He's surrounded by the Assyrian army. He gets a letter from Sennacherib, and what does he do? He spreads it before the Lord, and he prays over it. He lays it out before God. Here's a fifth conclusion. When we bring our trials to the Lord, we should take solace and comfort from His great love for us and not our love for Him. Did you see those words in verse 3? Isn't it interesting? Mary Martha said, Lord, behold, He whom you love, the one you love, not the one who loves you, the one you love. Don't say, they don't say He who loves you, they say He whom you love. Here's our comfort. Here's our solace, child of God. God loves you. God loves you. Don't take comfort in your great love for God. Folks, let's be honest. Does our love for God change from time to time? You know it does. The great old preacher years ago, J.C. Ryle, said, His love, God's love, never changes. Our love is wavering and uncertain. Matthew Henry said, Our love is not worthy of being spoken of, but His love to us can never be spoken of enough. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then finally, when we're suffering any trial, whatever it is, we should deliberately ask ourselves, how can we use this experience, this suffering, to glorify God? Some of you know our director of missions has been in the hospital for several days now, about a week now. Folks, here's what he said to me the other night. He said, Bill... I used to be skeptical about this virus. I'm not skeptical anymore, but I've seen God do things in my life and the lives of others. Folks, that's for the glory of God. You think that was fun to go through COVID? It's not. Ask anyone that's had it. It's not fun. But can God use that for His glory? The answer is yes. Amen? God can and does. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason Christianity is not making more of a dent in the consciousness of our world is because we Christians tend to act in the middle of all our trials and difficulties just like the unbelievers do. We act and talk and think the way they do. They want to know something that is perfectly legitimate for them to ask. What good is Christianity if it doesn't make any difference? If it doesn't change the way you think, live, or act, what good is it? And you and I, as children of God, need to deliberately ask God how we can glorify Him in the midst of our sufferings and our difficulties so that unbelievers around us will be able to say, hey, I see something different about that person. Christianity really does make a difference. Amen? Let's bow together and pray. Our Father and our God, we thank You for this reminder through this story of pain and suffering and death, of the man you loved. You loved his sisters, and yet he died. And it wasn't because you couldn't do something about it. It's because his death was there and recorded for all of time and history, the pages of Scripture, so that we would be reminded that even suffering, sickness, pain, and death can be used and should be used for the glory of God, whether healing or life or restoration or taking away pain ever comes or not, 
it can be and should be used for the glory of God. And so we're asking today, God, that we would take these words from the life of your only begotten son, Jesus, who showed us the purpose, the point, the plan of suffering and pain and difficulties and burdens. Would you help us to bear our burdens today, God, for your glory's sake, so that lost people around us would see, hey, there's something different about them. This Christianity stuff really does make a difference. It really is true. This is not just a bunch of words for some preacher somewhere. This is the truth that Christianity makes a difference. And Lord, if there's someone here today who's not, who is not a Christian, who is not saved, who has not trusted you, who has not put their hope and trust and faith and confidence in you and you alone, as we sing to you in just a moment, God, would you please tear down every obstacle, every obstruction, everything keeping them from coming to you, everything that's keeping them from trusting you, Everything that's saying, I can do this myself, I don't need God's help. Whatever that is, God, would you destroy that and tear that down in these moments that they would come crying to you, Jesus, save me from my sins. I can't do this on my own. I need you. And for those of us that have been saved, may we rejoice today that our God is a perfectly loving God who sees us and knows us in our trials and our difficulties and who cares and can do something about them whether we think so or not. And it may be, God, that you choose not to do something so that we can bring you glory by faithfully serving you through the difficulty, whatever it may be. Dear God, we're asking you to have your way with us today in every thought, every heart, every mind, every soul for the glory of God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.